Rugby World Cup 2023, folks. Quarterfinal number four. Hosts France taking on reigning champion South Africa. Big old game. Big game. Very much looking forward to this one. I can watch this one and enjoy it after probably suffering some high blood pressure from the day before when New Zealand, my team, take it on Ireland. This one is just pure, pure viewing pleasure for me. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to it. What I going to say? We're going to go through some lineups, some stats, recent history predictions, and you guys can let us know your thoughts on how this one is going to go. Obviously, France, top pool A. Uh, you know, beat the All Blacks in that opening game. One could argue that they, uh, the pool A teams are a little bit underdone, having not had the kind of stern tests that the pool B teams had. South Africa uh, could have beaten Ireland, could have topped the pool and faced the All Blacks, but they're facing France. Uh, that was the only game they dropped. They beat all their other opponents pretty handily in what was certainly a pretty tough pool. Uh, for France, the biggest talking point about their lineup is going to be the return of Captain Antoine Dupont after suffering that facial fracture only a few weeks ago against Namibia. He's back. Um, everything I've read about it seems to be that he's kind of been rushed back and... Um, I guess it kind of reminds me of Richie McCall like playing in 2011 with like a broken foot. Uh, he's going to be playing with a partially broken face. The recovery time I don't think has quite been met. So he's doing this at his own risk, but it's a Rugby World Cup quarterfinal at home. It seems to be that he's not going to miss this for the world. So broken face or not, Antoine Dupont captain of the side from number nine. But the front row is by Malvaca and Antonio. Some big units in that front row. There's a big scrummaging front row. And Cyril Bai uh, has got a wicked offload on him. Malvaca is great in space. And Antonio is just a big lump of a tight head prop. So that's going to be a fantastic battle up front. Cameron Wilkie and Thibaut Flamont is more of a kind of skills uh, second row than necessarily brawn. But they do have uh, Taufa Fenua to bring off the bench if they need to to add a bit of beef. And then Gelange, uh, Olivon and Aldrit are the back row. Really skilled back row, man. I mean, Aldrit just carries for absolute days. Uh, Olivon is probably one of the more skilled back rowers in world rugby. And Gillon is that kind of jack of all trades who's done really well to come back from a long-term injury and just hit form uh, at the World Cup, just able to find his feet and hasn't really looked out of place, which is a testament to him. Dupont, like I mentioned, continues on. Was back to the squad at nine, despite the facial fracture. So, um hopefully he's fine he's legit one of the best players in the world so we can all happy to be seeing him play as long as he's kind of good to go or as good as he can get and um that maybe takes away from a little bit of the way how good uh, matthew jalibert has been playing once uh Intermark went out pre-tournament it was looking you know not doom and gloom but it was certainly looking harder for france being without one of their kind of top players in a, a really important position but jelly has just taken to this task and uh, and run with it he's been really really re well running that uh french attack donty and fiku is a great midfield donty is a not only a big unit but he's great with his tackles and um you know his work at the breakdown is phenomenal fiku i've always sung his praises for the way he just seems to be everywhere in that French back line popping up uh, to give that final pass more often than scoring it himself. And then speaking of guys who are scoring, goodness me, Pinot and BLBRA have been fantastic. Like these guys have been getting into some genuine space. Uh, Pinot is the top guy in the competition for clean breaks with 11 and BLBRA has eight. So these guys are absolutely right up there. And Ramos with his big old boot is part of the reason they beat the Kiwis. Uh, you know, territorial kicking from Ramos and then kicking for poles, generally pretty good. So it's a pretty bloody good looking uh, French side. They've got Francois Clos on the bench, who is their top tackler. Olivon's not far behind him, but that shows you the depth of the squad that Clos is not starting for this one. Flamont also makes a bunch of tackles. Um, the top carriers for this French side are the likes of Ramos, Aldrit, Peno. Uh, so they're all starting. So a lot of their big guns are are uh, there, which is pleasing to see. Pugarit is uh, the replacement hooker. Wardy, Aldegheri, props. Telfa Fenua, like I mentioned. Course, like I mentioned. They've brought in Makalu for this one. So it's kind of like, it's not really 5-3, and it's not really 6-2. It's kind of like 5.5, because Makalu is uh, as a forward by trade, but can play in the back line. They've legit played him kind of like Quaker Smith. 
They've played him as a, as a back before. Luku and Moifana are the genuine back replacements. Luku covering halfback. Uh, he looked good in that final game of the French pool stage. And uh, Moifana, really flexible, covers the midfield, covers the outside backs as well. That's the French side. For, for uh, South Africa, a lot of talk about how people were expecting them to go with a 6-2 split. A lot of questions asked about Jacques Nina were about why didn't you go for a 6-2 split? He spent way too much time answering that kind of question. And he's basically just like, we picked the side we think is going to win the game. Uh, kind of simple as that. They don't always go with 6-2. Uh, Kitsov and Bonambi and Mal Herba, really tasty looking front row. Um, some of the best front rows in the world in that side. Obviously, they're without Malcolm Marks. He's another one of those guys that kind of suffered career, not career, uh, tournament ending injuries. But even without him, uh, having Bongi there is um, is a pretty bloody good replacement. And then scrum time, the battle with like the likes of Mal Herber and Kitsov up against Bay and Antonio is genuinely for the best kind of props in the world. So fantastic stuff for a quarterfinal. It's a bit of Moster in the second row. Moster has been getting through a bunch of his tackles. He's certainly one of the top tacklers in this box side alongside Captain Sio Colisi. And then uh, It's a Beth will be looking, I guess, to get on top physically. Um, because he's probably got a few kilos on both of the uh, French locks, although I haven't looked up those numbers. Uh, back row, Colisi, Peter Steff, and Vermeulen. Vermeulen's uh, inclusion ahead of Visa was also a talking point. Uh, it seems to be that the box are potentially looking at more nullifying the French kicking game. Certainly, Dan Vermeulen is great under, under high kicks. He can kick him, he can catch him from the restart. He doesn't usually kick him. Uh, but like Visa's probably got better ball carrying numbers than, than Dwayne. But maybe uh, Dwayne's more of a safe pair of hands. Uh, you know Peter Steffs is going to be high work rate and he is going to be probably charging down Antoine Dupont's channel all day long. And then uh, Sio Colisi, like I mentioned, tackling machine. And it speaks really well in the press conference as well. He's one of my favorite guys uh, to listen to. Like him and Andy Farrell are probably my two favorites to listen to in press conferences in terms of coaches and captains so yeah uh Corbus Reinach gets the nod at nine and uh Marty Lubok gets the nod at 10 there was a little bit of speculation that maybe Andre Pollard would get the nod especially with the goal kicking being such a talking point but as coach Jacques pointed out Marty kicked all his goals in that last game when he came off the bench and uh Corbus um gets the nod at nine ahead of Faf but Faf is on the bench Again, they kind of highlighted the French kicking game and they believe these are the best two nines to try and nullify that. I would also say Corbus adds a heck of a lot of toe, gas, speed at number nine. I mean, I know you got Grant Williams as well, who's uh, known for that, but he's not quite got the experience of, uh, of Corbus Reinach. But um, like in terms of clean breaks, Reinach is one of the top guys for South Africa and he's your nine. So a real threat there. Marty's going to pull the strings at 10. Um, they have got Pollard on the bench, I guess, if the goal kicking does go awry. But um, when he's on, he can kick him as good as anybody. It's just whether he's on. Uh, Dealing is there at 12. Jesse Krill's there at 13. So no Lucanio arm. They seemingly uh, didn't want to kind of disrupt things by chucking him in. But uh, Dealing is there in place of Esther Hazen. Colby's there. Arons is there. And Willems is there. That's a really attacking back three. There up against the French back three is just going to be fascinating because all those players, Aronza, Colby, Willemza, Ramos, maybe, yeah, you know, Ramos as well, BLB Ray, Pino, they're all really attacking minded players. So it seems like it should be a cracker. I mean, if you're looking for the clean break guys, I already mentioned Reinach, you've also got Colby, Aronza, those are the top guys for South Africa getting into some space. So yeah, believe it or not, Creel's also one of the top ball carriers for South Africa. I was a little bit surprised when I read that. Uh, recent history between the sides is not that recent because most of these games in the last five, the four South African wins, all predate Galtier taking over as French coach, and they are still, um, some of them predate the kind of Russi era. So, yeah, they haven't played a heck of a lot of games, you know, after COVID, they've only played the one. So that was in 2022. That was a 30 points to 26 win for France. That was the game where both sides had red cards. Dupont got red carded about halfway through the game and Peter Steff got red carded really early on. So fingers crossed we don't have any of that uh, in this game. For the stats between these sides, there are some kind of really interesting, I don't know, just trends with both of them. Like France, they score a lot more of their points in the first half and they concede a lot more in the second. So they're really... Quite a strong, I mean, they're a strong team overall, but they're an especially strong first half team. 
So one game in isolation could obviously be a different story. France could flip that on its head. But generally speaking, uh, you want to kind of weather that storm early on from the French and then see how well you can kind of hold on. They're also a team which is quite happy to play without the ball, which is not always the trend. You look at some of the other sides like Ireland and whatnot who really like to play with position, but they regularly have less than 50% position. Um, I mentioned that they kind of really dominated the territory against the All Blacks, which was a kind of key one uh, for them. And they also kick the ball a lot more than the Springboks. So they kick it 30-odd times a game in 2023 compared to the South Africans, 21. So maybe goes against the stereotypes that we think of with both of these teams in recent years. South Africa, their attack's sharp, man. They are getting over the advantage line. Like, remember, we always talk about that four meters per carry being the kind of gold, not the gold standard, but like the... The standard of, if you can get over that, you're generally going forwards pretty well. Well, South Africa's been at 4.9, so close to 5 metres of carry in 2023. There's only two games this year that they haven't met that, and that was uh, the Tonga game, where Tonga actually played really well. They were able to stifle the South African attack. It was a rejig side, of course, but they were able to stifle it a bit, and then um, that game against the All Blacks that they lost at Mount Smart Stadium. So generally, man, the South African attack's been able to get forward really well. And they don't concede many tries. They conceded three against Tonga, which was unusual. Prior to that, you're looking at one against Ireland, none against Romania, none against Scotland, one against New Zealand and London, one against Wales, one against Argentina. Yeah, man. Uh, South Africa doesn't doesn't cough up many tries. That speaks really highly of that Tongan performance uh, a couple of weeks ago. Goal kicking, though, we have to talk about the goal kicking. 63% in 2023 is among the lowest. Uh, again, not not with the stereotype of South African rugby when you think the likes of a Mornay Stain and whatnot, you know, being kind of just guaranteed points machines. It's been one area that they uh, haven't had. But then again, it was 100% last week with Pollard and Marnie taking the kicks. So we'll have to see. Interestingly, also, just in terms of those trends of point scoring, South Africa's most dangerous quarter is the third quarter. So immediately after half time, South Africa averaged more than 10 points and they concede almost none. They can average like one point conceded across all their games this year. And a few of those were against like five points against Tonga, I think. So it seems like whatever halftime analysis they do, it seems to work. They identify stuff going into the sheds and they implement it really well because across this year, that has been an absolute trend with the Springbok side. Um, predictions. The bookies have got this one with France as one point favorites. So saying it's going to go down pretty much to the wire. The rugby forecast algorithm, however, has South Africa as favorites with their win probability at 52.7%. So again, almost like the flip of a coin. There's not much in these sides. It's going to be massive. It's on at the Stade de France in Paris. You can bet there's going to be a lot of vocal French fans there. South Africa will want to quieten them down early. If France can get that early first half lead, like we spoke about earlier, um, they'll certainly get the crowd into good voice. It's going to be fascinating. 9 o'clock local kickoff, which is 8 a.m. for me here in New Zealand, which is perfect timing. Ben O'Keefe is the ref for this one. Fingers crossed we're not talking too much about him uh, at the end of the game or any of the refs this quarterfinal weekend. If you're looking for stuff to do between now and all the kickoff times in the quarterfinals, I recently released a video on the other channel, Two Cents on Tour, where I was going around China and I wanted to see a warship and boy did they want to get my information. I had to go through three different checks, passport, name, phone number, passport, phone number, name, and then bag scan. Just to see an old ship. I wanted to see a warship. Because we don't have many warships here in New Zealand. I wanted to see one. But yeah. Check that out. It's something a bit different. I genuinely shocked one of the girls at the um, at the kind of security check. But anyway. You guys let us know your thoughts. How do you reckon this one's going to go? Uh, and uh, yeah. I'll talk to you guys again soon. See you later.